Hello everyone, and welcome back to the Fluctus channel. In a treacherous sea, it is easier to thread a needle while riding a galloping horse than to land an aircraft on the pitching deck of an aircraft carrier. Despite the weather, arrested landings have always been a challenge for the pilots. But things go haywire at the very moment when an aircraft misses the arresting cables. While arrested landings seem quite easy and straightforward, a higher level of intricacy is associated with them. As the main part of the arresting gear, arresting cables or cross-deck pendants are laid across the flight deck. Usually, three cables are laid with a 110-foot spacing. The cables are tensioned to meet specific loads for each aircraft type. Pilots take visual guidance from the Fresnel Lens Optical Landing System. While the landing signal officer commands the pilots with minor adjustments for a perfect touchdown. We always practice flying the ball, which is that lens that we reference to make sure that we're not uh, too low, not going to fly into the jet shop. But on the ship, it's obviously moving away from you, so it's a completely different experience. Being an LSO, you, you see mistakes other people make and you try to learn from them. The winds are changing every day, the boat's moving at different airspeed, so you kind of have to take in all those factors and ignore them actually and just fly what you're used to doing, which is look at the lens that's telling you whether or not you're too high or too low and then go from there. An aircraft missing the arresting cable could trigger a vicious chain of actions. Usually, pilots apply full power the very second they touch the deck to tackle a bolter or a cable snap. With the high integrity built into the arresting systems, accidents pertaining to arrested landings have declined significantly. In 2016, the arresting cable snapped when trying to stop an E-2C Hawkeye aboard the aircraft carrier Dwight D. Eisenhower. The pilots brought down the aircraft smoothly, and the tail hook caught the fourth pendant. Everything was seemingly routine until the cable snapped, releasing the aircraft. Having been retarded by the cable, pilots lacked speed and plunged off the flight deck. The composure and exceptional skills of the pilots kept the aircraft aloft without hitting the sea and saved the lives of all on board. Another incident involving an F-A-18 Super Hornet occurred in 2015, when the fighter crashed into the sea after being catapulted from the aircraft carrier USS Theodore Roosevelt. The fighter had encountered an issue with one of its two engines and crashed in the Persian Gulf. The pilots ejected seconds before hitting the sea and were later rescued by a search and rescue team. This accident further exemplified the intricacy associated with carrier operations, especially the catapult launches and arrested landings. During such incidents, search and rescue helicopters would be the first to reach the crash site. Usually, the carrier air wing of an aircraft carrier has two helicopter squadrons that mainly undertake anti-submarine warfare. Vertical replenishment 
and search and rescue. Out of those duties, search and rescue missions pose great challenges as rescuers work against the clock, where a delay could cost lives. When the ship is underway, certain shipboard maintenance may require critical parts to be replaced for sustained mission capability. In such conditions, waiting for land-based assistance is a fruitless pursuit. To address this situation, modern aircraft carriers are equipped with a fully-fledged machine shop. Usually, both hull technicians and machinery repairmen make use of the carrier's machine shop to undertake a plethora of jobs. Hull technicians are responsible for keeping the shipboard structure in good shape. In addition, they take care of the plumbing and piping network and their fittings. On the other hand, machinery repairmen manufacture replacement parts. They exude excellent skills in computer-aided design and operating CNC machines, lathes, and milling machines. With the use of this machinery, they turn chunks of metal into working components that will keep the ship combat-ready and self-resilient. Apart from these assigned duties, both hull technicians and machinery repairmen play imperative roles in the damage control team. Right now, I'm making hinge pins for watertight doors. They have to fit really snug into the hinge, so I have to measure them frequently. A week ago, I saw my hinge pin in one of the watertight doors, and I was like, those are the pins I'm making, and I was really excited. <laughs> With all these efforts, the arresting gear will be maintained in a continuous state of operational readiness for immediate use. Cross-deck pendants are usually replaced every 125 traps. Unlike arresting cables, replacing purchase cables is labor-intensive and not frequently done. The terminals of the purchase cables are treated with extensive care due to their higher susceptibility to damage. Individual wires are then straightened by the power straightening device, which consists of a bent tube affixed to a drill. This prepares the cable end for installing the terminal fittings. With all these efforts, even when the condition of the arresting gear is maintained at its best, a successful aircraft recovery is greatly attributed to the skill of the pilot. Pilots undergo specially crafted training exercises that equip them with the required proficiency to handle adverse conditions while ensuring safety and operational efficiency. Field carrier landing practices are preliminary training that gives the pilots hands-on experience on carrier landing before they experience real-world grueling conditions. During the field carrier landing practices, the land-based runway replicates the deck of an aircraft carrier with all signage and landing aids. Landing practice. 
Uh, we've been using it for many years. It gives us uh, an authentic replication of the environment out at the ship. Uh, again, it gives us very good training uh, for our operations in the carrier qualification and then shipboard operations. Pilots approach the runway, maintaining the right glide path with the help of a Fresnel lens optical landing system or the meatball. The landing signal officer, or LSO, communicated with the pilots, as in a carrier deck landing, giving necessary instructions. Through the training, pilots become acquainted with maneuvering the aircraft according to the meatball while following LSO commands. Unlike landing on a land-based runway, the flight deck movement and airflow interference make a carrier landing more demanding. Pilots must line up with the center line while maintaining a right glide slope. The improved Fresnel Lens Optical Landing System is the primary landing aid that helps the pilots maintain the right glide path. It takes the carrier movement, aircraft category, and wing patterns into account when calculating the ideal glide path for each aircraft type. When the pilot's ability blends with the advanced landing aids and years of experience of the landing signal officer, a flawless landing could be anticipated. Despite their challenging nature, arrested landings have become a routine activity. The first Nimitz-class carrier, the USS Nimitz, completed its 350,000th landing in mid-2023. Having said that, when an aircraft that is even more challenging to land on a conventional runway decides to land on an aircraft carrier, things start to get feverish. Such an extraordinary feat unfolded in 1964 when the U.S. Navy, along with the CIA, decided to land a U-2 Dragon Lady on the USS Ranger. The Dragon Lady is a high-flying reconnaissance aircraft with a whooping wingspan of 105 feet. The aircraft was fitted with a tail hook and additional spoilers, while the landing gear was reinforced to withstand the immense stress exerted during catapult launches and deck landings. The U.S. Navy took their gallantry another step ahead and decided to land a C-130 aircraft on a carrier. It landed on the USS Forrestal in 1963, setting a world record for the largest and heaviest aircraft to land on an aircraft carrier. Like the U-2 Dragon Lady, the C-130 Hercules was never meant to be seen on a carrier deck. To make this hefty lifter carrier capable, its nose landing gear, braking, and fuel pods were modified. What makes this landing more interesting is that the aircraft was launched unassisted and landed unarrested. As widely believed, landing an aircraft still remains the most demanding task in the military.
while no pilot could predict the wind, the deck movement, or other external factors, having comprehensive training on catering to the dynamic demands while following safety protocols will pave the way for a flawless landing. That's the end of this video. I hope you enjoyed it. Make sure to subscribe to this channel so you don't miss any of our new content. See you next time.